How's everyone doing? Fantastic. It's a beautiful day in Colorado, my goodness. So I flew in from Boston last night, and I've just been enamored with the weather and with the scenery, with the setting, and um, don't tell anyone about it. I don't think I'm going to go back, all right? <laughs> All right, well, it's great to be here today, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, the future of healthcare. You know, patients today have an incredible amount of options for where they get care and how they receive care. Making it really mandatory and essential for us to think about how to redesign that care. It's not really optional anymore. We need to be on the cutting edge, and as was said here, we need to be nimble to make sure we're meeting patients' needs in the ways that they're going to want to be met. Now, AI is clearly shaping the future of really everything, uh, healthcare included. And what I want to talk about today is strategies that we can explore to really leverage this technology for us to be successful in meeting the needs of patients' care, but not just patients of today, but thinking about the patient of tomorrow and how we can shape the future of healthcare. But before we do that, I want to take you back a little bit because this is going to give you a little bit more context about who I am and um, kind of my lens that I bring to this whole kind of conversation. So I'm a surgeon. I trained as a surgical oncologist. I uh, did my fellowship at Roswell Park Cancer Institute a long time ago. And um, I got my first job working in uh, Vermont. So I'm in Boston now, but my first job was at the University of Vermont Medical Center, which is a small academic medical center uh, in a very rural state. And I had a really interesting opportunity when I first got into practice. I had a fantastic mentor who took me under his wing, and I don't know, maybe he just saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, but uh, he helped me get appointed as vice chair of our cancer committee, and then had me take over his role as cancer of, a chair of the cancer committee the year following. And during that time, it was a fantastic opportunity for me because I got a front seat at Leadership in Action because the institution had just come up with this, this idea that they wanted to revamp and redesign the cancer program. The entire cancer program, from top to bottom, every aspect of it needs to be redesigned. And the goal was really quite simple, it was to improve quality, okay? Very simple goal, but very complicated in terms of achieving that. So what we did is we formed, we, we approached this the same way that we approached cancer care. We said, okay, well, let's do this as a team. We had physician leaders, we had nurse leaders, administrative leaders for each of the different disciplines of cancer. And we got together on a regular basis, and this is what we were trying to achieve, this care innovation multidisciplinary clinics, tumor boards, clinical trials, nurse navigation, quality improvement, really, how can we improve the care of patients with cancer who are coming through our organization? And it wasn't an easy task. It actually took quite a bit of time. It was very intense. Uh, we had many setbacks, but the thing is that we were dedicated as a team. What was really motivating us was to drive to do better for our patients, just drive to improve the care for our patients. We'd meet regularly to brainstorm ideas, and what was really interesting is that, you know, sometimes the lung cancer group might come up with a great idea that was helpful for the colorectal cancer group, or the breast cancer group was doing something great that hematology can kind of adopt. And little by little, over time, we started to brainstorm and get these metrics together and really start to define what high-quality cancer care should look like and start to work towards making that a reality. And over time, we started to see the fruits of our labor start to mature, and we were able to deliver on many aspects uh, of our objectives. We saw our volume increase, our regional expansion increase, our quality metrics went up, we got some awards nationally about what we were doing and innovating. But the thing that stuck with me the most, and the reason I'm sharing the story with you, is a letter that I got from a patient. Um, this was a young mother who was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she had a fairly aggressive breast cancer, it required actually multiple trips to surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, oncology, a lot of treatment. So she really saw the inner workings of her entire cancer program. And what struck me was that she wrote a thank you letter to me as the chair of the cancer committee, saying that despite the fact that she was dealing with this life-threatening diagnosis in a very distressing time, that in a very odd way, the team made this very bearable and she actually put in the note that, in a strange way, the team made going through cancer a positive experience. And this is something that kind of really stuck with me over the years, over the decades. It really showed me the impact that we can have uh, on patient experience and as leaders kind of driving what care should look like. And it really reinforced to me that no matter what we do in terms of innovation, whether it's care processes or technology or integrating AI, 
We need to keep the focus on this patient. We need to keep the focus on what can we do to make things better for our patients, to make things easier for patients who are going through difficult times. All right, so this is just the lens that I'm bringing this to this conversation that I wanted to share with you. But now we want to think about the mindset for then how do we bring about these kind of changes. So let's start with this. Who can uh, recognize the individuals that I have up there? Just call it out. Got Wayne Gretzky. I'm a Canadian, so had to have Wayne Gretzky up there. Got the Wright brothers. Very good. Who else? Come on, call it. We got the Mayo brothers. Very good. Good crowd. The other two should be easy. Other two? Marie Curie, right? And obviously, right, Steve Jobs. That's usually the easy one. All right, but the question is, what do all these individuals have in common? So what they have in common are these, these are visionaries. These are individuals that looked at the world not as how it was or how it is, but how it could be. And in doing so, showed us how the world could be in ways that we may not even have thought about or imagined ourselves. And because of that, these are individuals who we, we recognize. We know who they are, right? They, they, they stand out. They've made a mark and an impact on the world. And they were very successful in what they did. Matter of fact, I'd say that they illustrate the fact that success favors the prepared, those who can think about the future and the way things, that, things need to be. Wayne Gretzky specifically was one of the greatest hockey players of all time. I think the term GOAT actually came uh, for Wayne Gretzky first before anyone else, the greatest of all time. And, you know, there's this famous interview, you probably have all heard this story, it's almost a cliche at this point. He was asked, you know, how is it that you're able to do what you do? I mean, he was like the number one scoring uh, athlete, just, you know, incredible records, just time after time, you know, all these championships. And how are you able to do what you do on the ice? And what did he say? You guys know this, right? He said, I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going to be. Right? And it's that forward-thinking, kind of visionary type of approach that allows him and others to be successful. And it's the exact same type of ideology that we need to have to be successful in patient care. And we see this in so many other areas, right? So many other areas of our lives. We think about all of these organizations who were the leaders, right? The, the, the top brands, the top names in their field, they're almost completely obscure this day, right? Why? Because they've been eclipsed by new disruptors, startups who actually saw the world in different ways and were able to meet customer needs in ways that the legacy organizations were not meeting them, right? We, think, we all know about the story about Blockbuster and Netflix. You know, it's so interesting about, you know, Uber. Had you talked to me like 20 years ago, I would have never thought I'd be getting into a stranger's car. I mean, that's the exact opposite of what I was taught to do, okay? But now, as I open up my phone, I say, oh, Greg is here in two minutes. Fantastic, right? And then I give them a five-star rating, right? I mean, it's, it's a different kind of world, but again, people saw the way that things could be and then showed us a better way, and then we all kind of followed along. I think Kodak is a fantastic example about this. You know, uh, Kodak, what I think is really interesting is that they were just synonymous with, with photography, right? And they were the leading uh, organization, leading in their field, and along comes the digital cameras. And what's really interesting is that they didn't get sideswiped, right? They didn't, like, not see this coming. As a matter of fact, there was a, a researcher who worked with Kodak who several years later actually came up with digital film. Like, so they knew about this. They had this capability, but they chose not to move forward with this. And they've done case studies on this, and it's really fascinating. They had the leaders and the executives and the board, board directors, and they asked themselves two questions. They said, okay, at Kodak, how do we make money? How does Kodak make money? Is it by selling cameras? No, no, it's by selling film. Right? Just like printers, right? It's not the printers, it's the ink that they make money on. So they said to themselves, okay, this new competitor with digital cameras, is that gonna impede our ability to sell film? No, we're not competing in that area. We're good, right? And where else do they make money? On the chemicals to develop that film. And they're saying to themselves, these new startups, are they making chemicals? Nah, we're good, right? And they sat on this, and then you know, history tells the rest of the story in terms of what happened to them. And the problem with these organizations was it, it wasn't so much that they were doing the wrong thing, right? It wasn't so much that they weren't, you know, meeting their customers' needs or, or, or doing things that had been successful in the past. But the problem was is they were doing the same thing despite the fact that the world was changing, despite the fact that we're now living in an age of information, convenience and control, and the traditional ways of doing things doesn't meet the consumer's needs adequately. And that allows for competition, allows for disruptive innovators to come in and take over. And 
healthcare is not immune to this at all. I think the exact same thing we're seeing this in healthcare. You know, I, I think about it from the convenience of my living room. I can plan a trip to Disney World for me and my, my family. Or I can book the flight. I can make reservations at the theme park, get a place to stay, make restaurants reservations, do the whole thing probably about an hour, an hour and a half at max, right? But if I was trying to change my next colonoscopy appointment, right, or, right, or arrange a, a, a refill for my daughter's uh, uh, allergy medication, the likelihood is I'm gonna experience a much more frustrating process, right? It's not gonna be the same ease and access, control and convenience as I would for other areas. But what's happening is that People are, are not blind to this. They're asking themselves, why is it in my finance world, in my entertainment world, in my retail world, everything is so seamless, but in healthcare, I still have to fax my doctor information, right? And that gap is becoming more and more intolerable, but it's also an opportunity for those who can meet those needs, who can fill the gap with technology, with innovation, with kind of focusing on what we can do to make lives easier for our patients will be the ones that will succeed in the future. So the future of healthcare, in my mind, is clearly gonna be digital. We need to have a digitally enabled healthcare system that allows patients to have that information, access, and control that they have in every other aspect of their lives. But people are in different phases of that digital journey. As we see here, gosh, they said the key to digitization is, digitization is the key, but uh, which one is it? <laughs> but in reality, um, big tech gets this, okay? They're all over this. They are making major moves and major investments to meet our patients' needs, right, with all of these digitally enabled tools. And the way that I see it is that, well, there are patients, so we really, really should be the ones that are making these moves, right? We shouldn't be having third parties coming in and, and providing to our patients when really that's our responsibility and our jobs. I think we need to lead this way because if we don't, right, I mean, this, this train is left, it's going, it's happening, but if we don't lead the way, if we don't have input into the way this is, that this is designed, into oversight, into regulation, to understanding how to do this for our patients, it's gonna to happen to us instead of with us, and we want this to be something that we take leadership in. I wanna show you this video here. I'm gonna ask you a quick question because I think that's gonna uh, tie into what we're talking about, but take a look at this video and just just tell me if you can identify the city uh, that this is happening and, and maybe who this um, this model happens to be for those of you who are up on your pop culture. Does any of that seem familiar? Location, perhaps. or who this model is. Any wagers? Yep. Oh my gosh, you've seen this already. You've, uh, uh, but you, you predicted it based on the title of the talk. So exactly, this is a virtual city and this is a virtual model. It was a trick question. It's nowhere and it's no one. It's fake, it's an illusion. Okay, there was never such a model, there was never such a city, there was never anyone walking down the street, but look at the details, look at the realism, look at the reflections in the water, look at the, the, the imprint on her face, right? Look at all these type of things that really, unless you knew that this was artificial, it'd be very hard to tell that this was completely um, an illusion. And I think that's what this shows us is that, you know, this is the power, but also the potential peril of AI. Okay. I hear stories about a grandmother getting a phone call from her 17-year-old grandson who wound himself in trouble on vacation and is now in being held by the authorities, saying that um, he needs her to wire her $5,000 so he can make bail and get back home and doesn't really want to call mom and dad because, you know, dad's been going through that whole thing with a stroke and he doesn't want to stress him out e even further. That phone call didn't come from the 17-year-old boy. That phone call was a deep fake made by AI. The details of what was happening in their family was scavengers off of Facebook finding out what was happening. And that whole story was factitious to scam this grandma out of $5,000. Okay. I'm telling people now and with my family, we have like a, a, a passcode, right, that only we know. So that if there's a phone call in an emergency, you can all say, well, what's the, what's the family passcode, right? Because honestly, all you need to do is pick up the phone and say hello, and they've got it. They can copy your voice and make a phone call that sounds exactly like you and have that kind of scenario. 
I think about this though for healthcare, right? We're protecting patient data as a new patient safety focus. It needs to be our priority because we're seeing this more and more every single day. Healthcare organizations, hospital healthcare systems, individual practices are being attacked by hackers, are being held by ransomware. Did you know that AI now can create its own ransomware? You don't even have to be a programmer to do this anymore. You can use AI to do this for you, all right? So we've automated uh, hacking into hospital systems. And guess what? Healthcare systems are one of the easiest areas to hack into compared to like retail and finance and business and, 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 and banking. So it's an easy target. Um, millions of dollars, incredible uh, uh, barriers in terms of uh, holding up care. I'm really concerned though, when you're thinking about that video and being able to create fictitious results, that there's gonna be a practice or a hospital that's gonna get a phone call saying that, you know, you give us $5 million or we're gonna insert tumors into 50% of your mammograms at random. That can happen today. We have that technology. So we need to be aware of what we can do to protect ourselves and to protect our patients, of course. And of course, you wanna have trusted vendors and you wanna have a good security system, an IT system, but do you know the number one way that hackers get access into, into the data, into our systems, into our practices? It's through us and our employees, right? Someone opening up the wrong email and clicking on a, on a link, right? Gives them access into your system and now you're a victim. So one of the ways that we talk about protecting your practices is to make sure that you train people, make sure that they're aware of these type of things, they know what scams look like, but to run fire drills, right? They have organizations where they'll send out, the organization will send out these emails just to see which of their employees, which of their staff will click on that link. And it's not punitive, but it's a great opportunity for education. It's a learning moment, right? Because I'd rather have that done in a simulated kind of uh, fire drill than in, in, in real life. So again, we need to be thinking about how we stay on top of the curve and really make sure that our practices are as robust and safe as possible because our patients are definitely going to be looking at these type of things. Now, I don't want to be all doom and gloom though because again, I do think there's a lot of enthusiasm around AI and how we can leverage that to improve our care. I had the honor recently of um, being invited by Eric Topol to join a Medscape uh, webinar on physicians use in AI. Uh, they had done a survey in 2023 uh, I think it was over a thousand physicians answered the survey and they looked at the different areas and kind of what the overall temperature uh, was uh, for AI. And it turns out that uh, across the board, across really all specialties and all age groups, you would think it'd just be the younger folks, but you know, older physicians, senior physicians too, there was a lot of enthusiasm about AI, but there was also a lot of caution, right? Concern about misinformation, about disinformation, about biases, about you know, these hacks and things like that. But there was a lot of enthusiasm about what AI could offer us, right? If we could get this right and leverage this the right way, this could be an incredibly transformative agent for what we do for our patients. Right now, if you look at this, this is the survey how AI is being used in most medical practices. It's mainly being used for research and administrative uh, purposes, and it's great at that. It's not so much for patient education, for diagnosis, or for treatment, but I think probably in the next few years, um, that's gonna change. And those of us who kind of get on board early, the early adopters, kind of the leaders and the pioneers, thinking about skating to where the puck is going to be, are gonna be the ones that are gonna be leveraging the first mover advantage for this. I think there's incredible potential to be integrating AI into the way that we educate our patients, the way that we make a diagnosis, and the way that we treat our patients. We're looking at this in my practice, in our group. So again, I'm in Boston now, uh, I actually run our breast care program. And I thought to myself, you know, we used to talk about Dr. Google, right? We're now gonna be looking at Dr. ChatGPT, right? And I thought to myself, I wonder how ChatGPT is educating my patients when they go to ChatGPT asking for questions, right? I mean, it could be great, but it could also be very dangerous because, you know, misinformation, disinformation around breast cancer diagnosis could be really significant, right? Details are really quite important. So we said, well, let's put this to the test. Let's, um, let's take some questions that breast cancer surgeons usually get. We actually went to the American Society of Breast uh, Surgeons website. Uh, the organization has a list of frequently asked questions, nine frequently asked questions about breast cancer surgery that patients ask. And we fed that into ChatGPT. Okay, these are questions that surgeons get all the time. And then I had a group of surgeons uh, assess the responses using some structured tools. One was called a patient education materials assessment tool that looked at the understandability and uh, reliability and the actionability of uh, the responses. So what was interesting was that the results of this study uh, were a little surprising to me. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, 
the uh, results were very reliable. Uh, overall, we rated it about four out of five in terms of reliability. Very, very minor inaccuracies that wouldn't really lead to any harm in terms of patient care. The other thing was that the information was very understandable. They were very good at kind of explaining things at a layman level without a lot of technical jargon or complicated medical terms that patients could understand. But what really struck me was that responses were incredibly empathetic. All right? The AI was very good at patient-centered care. All right? It was very good in terms of um, being compassionate in terms of its responses. It was, very, it was very humble as well. It didn't try to play doctor. It would often tell in the responses, you know, you would want to talk to your doctors about this or make sure to ask your doctor a little bit more details about what we're talking about. And I was just struck by just how well it really did all of these, um, all these tasks. So I don't think the question is, you know, if AI is going to be part of what we do. It's just really just when, right? Like, when is this going to become the mainstream? And I think, you know, folks like you who are very nimble, very agile, who are entrepreneurs, who are leaders, who are pioneers, right? This is where the puck is. This is where the puck is going to be. This is where we need to skate to, okay? We need to leverage this. We need to lead this. We need to embrace this. And we don't need to have this happening to us by people who don't understand how physicians work with patients, how the healthcare system works, how the ecosystem works, right? We want to make sure that we are driving this train, because trust me, this train is on the move, right? And we want to be uh, in the driver's seat. We are now going to look at expanding this um, and working on developing a breast-specific um, LLM or ChatGPT that we can utilize for our patients. And I'm just thinking, I'm imagining a world in the future where you know, we'll have an AI navigator for patients with breast cancer. Right? You get diagnosed with breast cancer today, it is a very stressful experience, not just because of the diagnosis, but because of the maze of the healthcare system that you have to try to navigate through, uh, towards. You've got surgical appointments, you've got medical oncology, you've got radiation oncology, you've got PET scans, you've got MRIs, right? You have all these things that you have to try to arrange. You know, we have human navigators, right? I have a nurse navigator with me with every single patient. Her whole job is to help to coordinate that patient's care, making appointments, sending reminders, you know, scheduling all these kind of referrals to make life easier for my patients. And honestly, as a director in cancer care services for over 20 years, that was probably the smartest thing I ever did, was to implement and embed navigation into the cancer program. It's a game changer in terms of the patient experience. It's a game changer in terms of quality uh, and adherence to care as well. But I can imagine having an AI-powered navigator who is there 24-7, seven days a week at the beck and call to that patient, who can help schedule their appointments online, who can send them text reminders for their appointments, who can give them explanations about what to expect for their upcoming biopsy or their surgery, who can follow up with them on a daily basis after treatment to make sure they're doing well, and has a million data points to choose from, right, to do an analysis to see how that patient is doing and to identify days before they run into trouble that there's a problem and alert me to say, you know, you need to reach out to Mrs. Jones because something's wrong with her wound, right, before she wants, ends up in the emergency department or before there's a, an issue. So this is the future that I envision, and this is what we're working towards. And I think there's so many other ways that we can leverage and utilize this, again, if we think about getting to where the puck is going to be. So again, the future is going to be very different than it is now. AI-empowered virtual reality, augmented reality, clinical decision point to support. Uh, there's just so many ways that we're going to be, I think, revamping the way patients receive care. Uh, we talk about the personalized care that I just mentioned in terms of the education and engagement we can have with AI. Uh, but there's also a lot of work that's been done with administrative efficiency, making our lives easier from day to day in what we do, right? A lot of people are using AI now for these prior approvals and denials and things like that, and just automating that so you're not wasting a lot of time with that paperwork and writing those letters and things, and things like that. I have a colleague of mine uh, who's in primary care who has an AI that will look at the upcoming clinic schedule and has a predictive algorithm that can identify a patient who's most likely not to show up for their appointments. The AI then contacts that patient, either by phone or by text, to confirm whether or not they're going to come. And if they confirm that the patient is not coming, it automatically goes down to the next patient who's waiting for an appointment and offers them that spot. His no-show rates have gone down to zero. And not one person in his office has to lift a finger to do that. It's all automated. It happens behind the scenes by AI. So tremendous potential in terms of um, increasing our efficiency. And guess what? Allowing us to have more time to do what we need to do is that one-on-one -on -one contact with the patient. 
remote monitoring. We have AI-enabled remote monitoring now that are going to really, really kind of change the way uh, we look at care and take things outside of the four walls of the hospital. I'm going to share another slide with that, so I'll, I'll move on to the next one. Uh, predictive analytics, using AI to identify at-risk patients, right? Who's at risk for having a stroke? Who's at risk for having an MI? Who's at risk for having cancer, right? We have data points now, millions of data points that have never been utilized um, that AI can kind of scan through and look at and actually generate people who are at risk and then intervene in ways that can uh, alleviate or take people off that path, right? Uh, we also have AI that's going to help with clinical decision support to allow us to be smarter, right? There was actually a, I forget if it was the AMA or, or, or Medscape, but the, the title was, are you ready for AI to be a better doctor than you? So I was intrigued and I said, well, let me read this. And it was really quite interesting. They had a series of different experiments and tests that were done looking to see how well AI did our job. They had one example where a group of emergency room doctors fed a whole bunch of patient records from the ED into, into the AI. Um, the diagnostic accuracy of the AI exceeded what they did in the ED. They had another group that was um, using AI to scan retinas, uh, did a much better job than any ophthalmologist could do in identifying uh, glaucoma. They have an AI that can analyze patients with neurological disorders tapping to predict who has Parkinson's better than any neurologist can do, right? So again, it's not that AI is gonna take our jobs, but clearly physicians who embrace and utilize, utilize AI will replace those who do not. I had mentioned about the home monitoring. Uh, this home hospital model is uh, something that's very big in, uh, in our area in Boston, uh, mainly at Mass General Hospital, which is uh, one of the hospitals in the Harvard uh, healthcare system. I'm actually at Beth Israel. Uh, there's Brigham and then Mass General. Um, the home hospital model has really kind of blown me away in terms of literally delivering hospital level care in patients' home. Uh, I've even read about reports about home dialysis, which to me as a surgeon who went through surgical training, who put in central lines, who was all about sterility, was like, how could this possibly be? Like, this is a disaster. But it turns out that home dialysis has fewer infections than we do in the hospital. One, because they don't have all the other nosocomial infections from other folks, but also because who has the greatest vested interest in avoiding an infection? The patient. So they do the protocol perfectly well every single time, right? So it's really quite, quite incredible. And what we're seeing now with the home hospital model, using things like AI-enabled remote monitoring and whatnot, that the mortality rate for these patients is very low. The readmission rates, right, the number of times that we have to rescue them from home and actually get them back to the real hospital is actually pretty low as well. And look at this, 32% cost reduction. There was one organization that did a pilot. I think they enrolled, um, in a very short period of time, they enrolled, I think, nearly 1,000 patients uh, in home hospitals. So then that tells you at least how enthusiastic patients are for this. Um, they enrolled 1,000 patients in the home hospital model. Uh, they, they ran this, I think it was for less than a year, and they calculated about a $6.8 million savings from this. So talk about value-based care, talk about where we are in terms of the policies and what's driving the future of healthcare. Home hospital is clearly going to be a major driver, okay? Just because it's gonna be beneficial for our patients and it's gonna be the only way that we're gonna to start to kind of bend that cost curve. So the question that I have is that, you know, as members, leaders, pioneers in DPC, how do you integrate yourself into the home hospital? What are the opportunities for you to leverage clearly something that's coming down the track uh, in a ways to uh, promote your practices, promote your panels, and to do things better for your patients? So uh, I think this is a, a clear area where there's a huge amounts of opportunity. All right, but everything that I'm talking about here requires change. It requires us to think about things differently, to deliver care in different ways, and change is hard, right? Why is change so difficult? Well, it's simple because one, we're living in a very high stakes environment and we're very hesitant to change. Right? I've been doing breast cancer surgery and other kinds of cancer surgery for 20 years now. I'm reluctant to change the way I do things until you give me a really good, compelling reason to do that. Change is also uncomfortable, right? If I'm gonna approach my patients in a different way after doing things for 20 years, you're gonna take me now from what I would think would be a very high skilled area and make me back to be a learner. That's very uncomfortable. I don't want to be there. I don't want to do that. So I'm gonna have a natural resistance to something like that. And also change might require loss or letting go, right? We talked about before where there are a lot of other industries where people are very worried about their jobs. Okay, a lot of information industry, copywriters, things like that, very worried about uh, the future of their jobs. But you know, think about what I talked to you about, about the, the, 
retinal scans and the detecting neurological symptoms and diagnosis in the ED, these are actual physician jobs uh, that could be replaced. And again, there's going to be a lot of resistance uh, because of that. I think what it is, though, it really comes down to we're creatures of habit. Right? We learn to do things in certain ways. We like to do things in certain ways. And the natural way of things is not to think outside the box. Right? Most people are not like you. They're not pioneers. They're not leaders. They're not thinking outside the box. And um, you know, I think I have a video that probably illustrates this better than I can explain about just how difficult it is sometimes to see things outside of your, your norms. This. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's nothing else left to do, is it? <laughs> All right. So needless to say, change is very hard, okay? We are creatures of habits, right? But the reality is, listen guys, change is the law of life. I love this quote. Those who only look to the past or the present or certainly miss the future, okay? So we need to embrace change. But more so, we need to lead others through change as well. And we need to bring about the kind of future of healthcare that our patients demand, that our patients need, that our patients deserve. Now, in order to do this, we need to adopt a disruptive mindset. Okay? Uh, first and foremost, we need to be more curious and less skeptical. Right? I was the first person to say that this Lyft, Uber thing would never take off, but look at what happened. Okay? Um, I'm a very kind of traditional person stuck in my ways, and this is something I need to think about all the time, is but being more curious and less skeptical. Not, not, pitting, not, not necessarily not being critical, but going beyond just pointing out what the holes are, but looking at where the opportunities are. Okay? Um, I'm the kind of person who my residents actually used to make fun of because uh, you know, I, I would never text uh, in the hospital. You know, I, I kind of figured texting is something that you do with your family, with your kids, but you know, that's not professional, right? And I had one fellow, one of the residents, senior residents, he sent me a text about an update of my patient. I'm gonna share this with you because I feel comfortable and confident with you guys, and I think we're bonding kind of close, a little bit of vulnerability here, but he sent me a text about one of my patients, and uh, I went to the office and responded to his text with an email. <laughs> I think he was shocked, he was floored. He actually came to me afterwards in the OR, he's just like, is something wrong with your phone, Dr. James? I mean, seriously? I texted you, responded to me by email? All right, well, I've been rehabilitated. I now will do texting in the hospital, but I draw the line at emojis. No emojis, never, <laughs> never at work. All right, but being more curious and less skeptical, okay, that's very important. Think about what are the trends, what are the techniques, and, and, and ask yourself, well, how could this work? Instead of just like saying, well, this is not how we do things. Number two, we want to look to other industries, right? I already talked to you about where other industries are making strides far beyond what we're doing in healthcare. We need to look at those industries because guess what? Our patients are in those, in, in those worlds. They're experiencing these things. We need to think about how we can in integrate this into what we do in healthcare. And the third thing is, listen to your patients. Listen to when they complain. Listen to their pain, listen to their barriers, listen to their obstacles, listen to their challenges, because these are all opportunities for us to do things in ways that will alleviate that pain and be innovative in ways that will improve their experience. And there's a breast cancer program that did just that. They sat down with a bunch of patients. We've done that as well. And we asked them, hey, what worked well and what didn't work well? And that information about what didn't work well spurred a lot of creative innovations that I think elevated the program. So think about what your patients are experiencing and how we can utilize technology and other innovations to make life a little easier for them. In addition to running the breast cancer program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, I also get the opportunity to teach at Harvard. Uh, most of you know that Harvard has a wonderful medical school, but they also have an executive education corporate learning wing 
And uh, in this program, they asked me to come and teach on healthcare transformation. I have a background in healthcare and management as well. I've done a lot of consulting in terms of what works for changing in healthcare. Um, so they asked me to come and teach at this course. And what's fantastic is that I get to work with non-physicians who are very interested in transforming healthcare. So these might be engineers, they might be entrepreneurs, they might be founders, MBA types, things like that, but they all have this desire to kind of change healthcare. Okay? Um, what they're lacking is an understanding of how healthcare works. So what we do is that we give them this education, we have them get an inside view into the ecosystem of healthcare. How do physicians work with patients? How does healthcare policy work? How does reimbursement work? So that when they come up with these ideas, when they come up with these wonderful solutions, it's aligned with the way healthcare works, right? So this wonderful marriage between, I think, healthcare and non-healthcare uh, individuals who want to transform the experience. And what I find is really great about this program is that for the first time, I'm interacting with non-professional colleagues, not other physicians, who are just as interested in transforming healthcare as I am. And the reason is that, you know, I may have an MBA, um, person who runs a company, runs a business, or an engineer whose father had a stroke, and they saw how limited um, care and treatment was, or how hard it was to get physical therapy, or a daughter who has uh, uh, asthma, uh, who was misdiagnosed or mistreated or had some kind of issue, uh, uh, a son whose father had a, a fatal effect because of a medication error. So now they are passionate about improving healthcare, they're passionate about transforming uh, healthcare, and we can kind of work together and collaborate, to, right, physicians and non-physicians on how we can make things better. So one of the things I want to do is kind of share with you some of the lessons that I've learned kind of in this program, working with uh, others and, and, and helping others with startups uh, about innovation. And it's a little counterintuitive because the first thing I'm going to tell you is that it's not about the technology. Right? So as I'm here giving a talk about AI and digital health and innovation, I'm going to tell you it's not about the technology. Right? It's about the problem the technology is going to solve. We need to make sure that we're not just looking at the flashy object or the shiny object and get distracted with what it can do. We want to look about what it should be doing for our patients, right? It should be meeting specific needs for our patients. Remember those pain points that I'm talking about? We want to laser on that and make sure the technology that we adopt, that we embrace, that we lead, that we experiment with is definitely meeting specific identified needs and not just doing something because it can do something. We want to make sure that that technology is aligning with the goals of our practice. Right, with the culture and the values of our practice, of our patient population, about what we're trying to do, whether it's preventative care or mental health or, or wellness and well-being. We also want to make sure that we're focusing on the way we implement this technology in a way that's going to be seamless, in a way that fits in with the way our practices work, that looks at the workflow of our frontline staff and our nursing staff and, and other folks to make sure that we're not trying to put a square peg into a round hole. And when we kind of do this, not focus so much on the technology, but on what the problem the technology is going to solve, Right? It just eases that adoption, it eases that implementation. So I think this is one of the lessons that I've learned that are very helpful in terms of embracing change and bringing about these types of, uh, these types of revolu uh, uh, revolutions. The last thing I want to share with you is, again, leading others through change. Because none of us are going to go on this journey alone, right? We all have people that we, that report to us, people who work for us, people who work with us, colleagues and so forth, and we need to get them behind the change as well, right? That story that I talked about at the very beginning about how we transformed cancer care delivery to the point where a patient said this was somehow a positive experience, that couldn't have been done if it was just me alone or one or two other directors. We had to really engage the entire team in change. So how do you do that? How do you make sure that everyone's engaged in change? Well, we need to look at uh, this little quadrant that I came up, and again, like I said, I did a lot of prior work in change management in healthcare, and I've kind of distilled it down to what I think is a very simple and easy way for us to think about it. I call it the four quadrant framework. It's the type of people that you'll encounter and the ways in which you need to lead them through change. So on the x-axis, we have commitment, right? How driven are they on the mission? How, 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 how well are they sold on what we're trying to do, right? What's their level of commitment? And on the y-axis, I have capacity. Right, what's their current level of actually achieving or affecting change? And depending on where you're on that access, you'll fall into one of these four categories, so either an enthusiast, a champion, a skeptic, or an obstructor. So the first area, the yellow quadrant, these are individuals who are highly committed, so they're with you. They've drank the Kool-Aid, they've bought in, they're like, yes, change must happen, definitely want to do this, but they have no idea how to do it. All right? I like to think about it, these are our medical students, right? They're like, rah, rah, go, go, but they don't know anything. <laughs> So what do we need to do with these individuals as leaders to lead them through change, right? That's when we have to put on our coaching hat. 
right? We have to develop them. We have to mentor them. We have to give them the skills. We have to give them the training. We have to give them growth opportunities and allow them to build their capacity so that they can affect change. Green Quadrant are individuals who are highly committed as well, and they're highly capable. They were doing the thing even before you thought about doing it, okay? And as leaders, what we need to do here is we need to recognize that these are our champions that we must empower, okay? We want to make sure that we're removing obstacles, giving them opportunities to lead, and giving them the opportunity to kind of lead the way and inspire others towards change, okay? These are individuals that will allow you to do a lot more than just a single person calling for change alone. Blue Quadrant, these individuals are not committed, right? They're like, yeah, we'll see. Or, yeah, we've gone through some change initiatives before, we'll just wait this one out, or, you know, I see a lot of errors in your thinking, or I'm just not really behind this, right? But oh my gosh, they have the capacity. They're very influential, right? Maybe they can sway others. Uh, they have a lot of uh, potential, right? So as leaders, if we're trying to really bring about change in our practices, right, we want to think about how do we inspire and influence these individuals. And you do this by kind of thinking about what's in it for them, okay? You need to speak to people's why, okay? Why is this important? Why would this be helpful? Why should I be doing this? And once you kind of answer those questions, okay, you'll get more people that will shift into that green quadrant and help you to move things forward. And the last quadrant is the red quadrant. These are individuals who are not committed, and you know what? Even if they were, they wouldn't be able to do it, okay? Um, they're just the obstructionists. They just will not kind of move towards the tides of change. They're getting in the way. What do we need to do as leaders with this group? Right? We need to really exercise accountability and mitigate the impact they'll have. The problem is, as leaders, what we tend to do, me included, is try just to ignore them, okay? What happens is that when you ignore them, it kind of festers, and what you permit, you promote, and that starts to become more the norm. And what happens is that they start to demotivate the people that you're trying to coach and train. They get in the way and become a thorn in the side of those that you're trying to empower, and they just kind of uh, reinforce the skeptics who you're trying to influence. And the more that you ignore this group, the more that they can derail your efforts to try to make change. I've seen this on small scales and, and small individual practices all the way up to major healthcare systems. It kind of holds true. Um, you need to have the accountable conversations with these individuals. You, let them, you need to let them know where things stand, where things are going, and what the consequences are. Okay? It's difficult conversations, but it's really absolutely necessary to affect change. So I found this to be incredibly helpful. Um, it's very simple. I like things that are simple. I'm a surgeon, so I think, like to break things down. Uh, but it's been a very effective way uh, to lead change, both small and large in organizations, and I, hopefully something that you'll find uh, helpful as well. So uh, in the time that I have left, I just want to leave you with one more image. Uh, I like this image because I think it's very uh, illustrative. It's a good metaphor uh, for what we are doing as leaders, as pioneers. You know, just like this drop of water creates ripples that goes really far beyond what the eye can see. The decisions that we make today, the actions that we take after leading this, leaving this conference, these can start creating these waves of positive change that can really create ripples that start to reshape, and reform, and redesign what the future of patient care is. So I invite you to join me in this journey of transformation. Please contact me uh, if you'd like to learn more. And it's been absolutely a pleasure addressing you today. Thank you very much.